You know, as you can see in our study today, I have slides that are in Croatian. If you go um, in this other church, there's also a Serbian translation if you'd like to find it later. Language is not that important, but if we hear some sort of quote or citation, if you read it, and we try to, to many times, try to understand one sentence, and at the end, we don't realize that we didn't get enough information to grow deeper with this. So it's very important for us. Um, what we say is going to be on these slides, so I'd call you to start from the beginning. Among Christians, there's the word which is made up of two words, which came from the Greek, and that is te uh, theology. Many times, um, we we are worried about these um, um, perf um, instructive words. But our goal here is that many times people understand what is teaching to understand and simplify what we're talking about. The Greek word of theology comes from theos, which means God. And the Greek word and the Greek word logos, which simply means word. When you open if you uh, open John one one in the beginning was the word and the word what the word lo uh, logos but simply you know in our language too if I tell uh, brother Mladen come I'd like to have a word with you and that word lasted for an hour when we <laughs> discussed this one word the word word has a much deeper meaning it could mean doctrine it can mean a seminar it could be a teaching it could be science it could be and it could have a much deeper meaning so the word theology simply means uh, um, doctrine of God or learning of God but this word is a very general word and it said the word that that encaptured everything that was talked about God, everything that was um, taught on the basis of the Holy Spirit. But in a specific situation, theology, our understanding and thinking about what we're getting from the Bible, connected with knowledge that we can get what the godly scriptures have shown us, what is that that we can understand about God? Theology, the science of God, the doctrine of God. As I already mentioned, when we're talking about a God, we're coming on this holy ground, which is already much, much closer. So we have to come to this huge respect when we're coming and humility. But there's another thing that we need to remember, that the, um, the being and the nature of God is a mystery that is beyond our human understanding and logic. One of these aspects of this mystery is that the, the God, the Godhead is made up of three beings which are unified in the, um, in the measure and activity, but they're actually, um, they are actually an individual being, each one of them. This concept is not very easy to understand. It's hard to understand how plus one plus one equals one. Did you ever notice that? It's when you look at in math. It's not. It's illogical. Why? Me and my wife, we when we got married, we became one, one, um, one person. But we truly are two different people. We're never one plus one is one. One plus one is always two. And that's why when we're looking at it in that way, people use math to try and explain God. And that's why, this is why it's a one big mystery. But you'll see soon, it's not that big of a mystery because many times in our everyday lives, in our conversation, we have 
the same types of mysteries, but that's become a part of our conversation, and it's a saying that so many times we've used, and we're so familiar with it that we that we don't really think about it. So we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. I want to talk about one um, citation from Ellen White. I take this very seriously. She says, The revelation of himself that God has given his word for our study. This we may seek to understand, but beyond this we are not to penetrate. People try to define God's uh, ways, and they try to allow themselves to just keep uh, debating and trying to understand of this omnipotent, omniscient God. When we're reading this citation, please don't don't say that Ranko Stefanovic is, is picking on certain people. But he, if he's picking on certain people, if I'm pointing at people, three fingers are pointing back at me. When we're always under the temptation when we're talking about God, using our, unlim- our limited understanding, we try to understand some things that we try to explain, which are never able to be as- explained. And that's why Sister White calls each of us. I think this citation really um, prepares us in this a moment for those that are watching now and not watching online. The highest intellect may tax itself until it's wearied out in conjectures regarding the nature of God, but that will be fruitless. If we f- were able to find out everything about God, none of us here would become a better Christian. Branko Stefanovic wouldn't become a better Christian. He would just be more arrogant, and you wouldn't even be able to talk to him anymore. That's why the Bible never tries to explain God. It just tries to show us something about his nature because that is what can bring us closer to God. That's what can bring us this big gift of salvation. Um, The effort will be fruitless. This problem has not been given to us to solve. No human can comprehend God. One more thing I need to notice when we're talking about this is other people say there's not one day that passes. I'm sure I'm going to see lots of uh, messages that I'm going to get after this seminar on my email or messages when this is over true sincere people that are trying to find the, uh, trying to find answers to these questions how can you talk about trinity when the trinity doesn't show up in the bible is that true yes it's true this is a word that christianity came up christians came up with okay so if we're using this logic so you have your bible can you show me where lucifer is mentioned in the bible I know that this is a big shock for all of us that are sitting here. Um, it doesn't come from the Bible. It, um, when they translated the Bible from Hebrew to Latin, they came to the, the book of the prophet Isaiah, the 14th chapter in our language, it says, the morning star he was trying to translate the Hebrew word that talks about this morning star and he used the word Latin word Lucifer which means from the Latin word from the Latin word we got this Lucifer the Latin language is not the the language of heaven and he didn't have a Latin name with God when he was up there so maybe is it is it incorrect to use the word Lucifer no it's not if that makes if that worries you then use the morning star and that's what the prophet Isaiah was trying to tell us you understand the word is not used in the Bible doesn't mean that that's uh, the wrong word to use. Even the word 
word um, baptize. He's talking about in the Serbian and Croatian language the word to use and in the Serbian is Kristiti, which is the word Christ trans uh, made into ba- the word baptism. They started to, so it actually is the act of doing this cross. But when we use the word as Adventists, when we use this word baptize in our language is to cross yourself, you're not crossing yourself. It's the Greek word is baptisma. When you translate in English as baptize, actually is what the word means. But in the Serbo-Croatian language, it's not, there's no word for that. The Greek word shuv simply means you're walking in this direction and you change your around and you go back. Shuv means to turn around and go back. We talked today about um, um, dedicating women. We're talking about w- women ordination, yeah. There are these words that we use all the time that we think they're in the Bible, but they're not mentioned in the Bible. Do you, th- do you think that it's wrong when we use those words? No, those are phrases. These are phrases that Christians came up with to define one concept and one phrase people can, from different denominations, use. We as Adventists use this word, and you'll notice that in today I'm going to try to use this word to completely avoid, because so Trinity is it reminds people of that general belief of what people believe in the Trinity, which is connected to the Catholic Church. But we Adventists, when we translate Trinity, it doesn't have anything to do with the, the teachings in the Bible, so how you can see how this one word ha- can have many different meanings. As we've mentioned, Trinity has some um, negative understanding. And I, I always say, let's change it. Let's use, why do we have to use Trinity? So our church has actually accepted the word Godhead. In so the word Godhead is is very different than the word God. And we're going to talk about that in a bit. When we use the word Godhead, we're talking about three heavenly beings, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In this unity, their unity, one um, among each other. Another thing we need to keep in mind is the concept of Trinity is never a, an under, um, a clear is not never clearly explained in the Bible we have many questions about the Bible we have the questions of what are the proofs of evidences of the the, um, the existence of God Why is it hard to find in the Bible? Because when the Bible was written, these questions were never asked. That's why we can't find the existence of God in the Bible. There's many things that exist that aren't given to us in the Bible that aren't um, normally mentioned in the Bible, like, like Trinity. We have to understand the Bible is not systematic theology. It says, now, brothers and sisters, try and understand what the Bible is teaching us about God. Take take your Bible and read five, page 535 to 570 and and let's try and understand what the Bible is telling us. It's not systematic. You know, when you talk to people about Sabbath, you can't say from this to this page we're going to find about what the Bible teaches about Sabbath. There's nothing like that that exists in the Bible. The Bible is written, like Sister White, is written for practical things. When needs were, were, came about, then God would talk to his people about this need. That's why when you want to talk about Sabbath, what do you have to do about Sabbath? You have to... Um, come to different spots in the Bible to understand when the needs came up, how and on which way God was talking to people about this. 
That's the same. Uh, same thing that we're talking about today. Many people aren't aware of that. From one side, we have um, numerous biblical texts, and only some of them you'll see this morning, which are clearly um, pointing to this plurality of the Godhead. It's not just one human. It's not one, even our Adventist church. This is so um, known in the Bible, and when you're understanding the Bible, it's so clear that the Bible gives m numerous evidences of this concept of Trinity. But on the other hand, for, the, the, for it to be a sure situation, we have to accept and realize that there are a numerous un understand, uh, not unclear texts in the Bible that are very confusing. And I, I believe, I didn't ask anyone to, I believe in this corridor, when you're talking about the Holy Spirit, you probably came to some very confusing texts that you're, the teacher was sweating when these questions were, came about, or these texts came about. We have to understand that there are uh, things that are hard to understand. If you go to Second Peter, in the third chapter, Peter talks about, in the letters of Paul, there are, the epistles of Paul, there are things that are hard to understand. There's, for many things, there are, there are many difficulties. Peter, in his time, when Apostle Paul was still alive, he said to the, the epistles of Paul, there are things that are hard to understand. And he said, people that are uneducated, people that are unstable, untaught, they kind of interpret these texts on their way, but they don't do it on purpose, but they aren't educated, and they take these texts to try and under to, to try and um, prove and convince other parts. We have to understand if there is many clear verses, and on the other side there are some unclear, very confusing, we have to those confusing ones, we need to try and understand them with the ones that are clear, and which one are without thought true that's not that's not just for the bible that's for any any um teaching or any science to do you're gonna if i say something here clear i say if i say something clear i was in toronto today on this date and then i say that at the same time i was in london is that possible that i was here most of the day but maybe in the evening when i was going home i went to london so you can see for you it's something that's confusing you're going to start to you're going to start explaining with something that was very clear which i mentioned earlier i hope that what i'm telling you isn't very confusing because all discussions uh, about god come to this let's now go to to um, continue with the time in front of us let's look at a few clear uh, verses i'm not going to talk about the confusing uh, texts that's maybe time for um a little bit later if we have questions if you have questions later we can answer them people ask the question The doctrine of Trinity is not so specific and complicated. When people come to the New Testament, they found so much proof. But the truth is that the Old Testament, we don't have. We have. We don't have clear explanations of the Trinity. There's a clear explanation when the Israelites left the, their country and they came to the Promised Land. What was that constant temptation that they were that were they were having? Um, having more than one God was the issue that they were always having plural gods so when we come to the Old Testament this wasn't a test of their faith of their faith to God but when you go to the Old Testament there's something really interesting something that we're going to see I would like 
to give you a warning. Whenever people try to read these biblical verses, they always are trying to prove something here. What we're going to bring here is not... It's not that it's showing us proving something because people that don't agree with this can prove something else. It just bring us to this um, thought and to ask us, what should we do with this, these texts which are found, which they're found? And we're going to start with the thing that is the most basic, something we need to understand, and that is the word for God, which is mentioned in the Old Testament, in this ancient word. And the word is Elohim. Something really interesting is that the word Elohim, which you see im at the end, is actually a plurality. You that speak English, the same in English that we have, when we add the word s at the end of a noun, it's plural. I'm trying. It's hard to translate this. I don't want to say, I don't want to say God. It's hard to uh, translate into s the Serbian Croatian language, but in English, it's it's clear. It's God's. It's plurality. So just to show you how complex this is, if you go into the Book of Ruth, you know this um, s this event very clearly. If you go to chapter one of Ruth, verses fifteen to sixteen, you can see the understanding of this word, and she said. Who is she? Ruth. See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. What word is used in Hebrew? Elohim. She's going back to her gods. Return after you. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from you. Falling. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. What's using here? your God, my God, it's actually your Elohim is my Elohim. If you look at the the ancient uh, languages here, Naomi says to Ruth, return to your Elohim. All hope has gone, is lost. But Ruth responds to her, and she says, your people shall be my people. Your Elohim is a replacement for my Elohim. I left my gods. But you'll notice here that when we use in our language, we use the word Elohim, we use it with a capital E, God of gods. But here is the word of the name of God, how it's mentioned in the Bible. Just to see the, the definition of this word. You have to know that when the he in the Hebrew language you use the word Elohim for God, the Hebrew language is very precise. For example, the word water and, and sky, it's always in a plurality form. Why? Because, because the old Hebrews believed that there was three heavens, three skies. The, th the sky that where the rain falls, the rain, the, the sky that which is where the stars are, and the and the heaven or the sky where God resides. It's always in plurality, just like water. Water isn't one amount of water. Water has in the Bible. There's a river. There's lake. There's oceans. You can see how Hebrew is always very precise. So they're always using these words in plurality. I know people like to talk about the Hebrew language. Let's talk a little bit in our language. Here, you have a choir. And when you say, when you say to the church, when you say the church choir was yesterday, yesterday had a, had a practice. When you see the word, when you use had, is that a plurality or, or a singular? Is a choir, plurality, or, um, or individual? We can sit here and debate stupidly, but there's only one person who sings and it's a solo. To have a choir, there has to be more than, more than two. If you have two, it's a duet. Then it's not a choir. So when you use the word choir that had a practice yesterday, 
You're using a singularity. We're using this way of conversation. It's a part of our dictionary. It's become normal. And it, we're, there's no point to debate it. The, the word group, the word nation, the whole nation was doing something yesterday. The whole nation got together. Nation is always is a singularity, but it's always in plurality. Um, a gathering, socializing. Just like that in, in Hebrew, um, something that's become part of their everyday understanding, when they were talking about God, who was a God of the Israel nation, they used the word Elohim, which actually meant this, this um, unity of one God, but it also talked about the plurality of the, the divine beings. Here I just added it one thing so you could see one of the most important um, parts of a dissertation of this man who was for years and years studying this this topic. He is one of the most famous um, names in Christianity, how the word Elohim was a, was um, was unique to the Hebrew and Israelite nation, not not in the other. There, it didn't exist in the pagan nations because it was Elohim was a name for God, which was. You can um, find this book. It's very hard to read, but it's fantastic. So, the word Elohim, when we talk about a collective. Uh, individualism we ta it's announced it, it's clear in Deuteronomy 6 4 the Lord's hear O Israel the Lord our God Elohim the Lord is one often when we come to this verse with keeping in mind that the Old Testament, the emphasis is that God is of the Israelite nation different than the pagan gods who was always a temptation for the Israelite nation. People read this verse in a certain way that the that God is one and that there's no other God but Him. But be careful, this is one aspect of this. Oh, he, he's just explaining why the Greek isn't coming out because it's a different computer. So it didn't come out clear in, in the Greek. Here, Moses, when he uses the word one, uh, he uses a head, which means one. One, two, three. But there's also another word, another Hebrew word, and that's the word yahid, which is also means one, which means that there's one and no other next to it. So both words have a numerical value, but the word ahad in the Old Testament has a very interesting uh, meaning when we're talking about um, a, um, a unity that has a multiple components to it. So when you talk about one nation, when God, when you know, when remember when God confused the languages in Genesis 11, He says one nation. The word Ehad is used, one nation, which is made up of many different people. Then you have, I'm going to go a little bit faster. You have many uh, proofs in the Old Testament of using the word Ehad. But there's something that which is in very interesting. The word Ehad. For us to completely understand, that's used in um, Deuteronomy 6.4, which is written from um, Genesis, second, the same person that wrote Genesis, in, in Genesis 2.24, we read how God created the first people. And it will, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. They'll say, Ehad flesh, Ehad Asad, one flesh. The same word that's used for God in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, for us to understand what Mo uh, Moses is trying to tell us here. We need to go to, you can see there's so many biblical scholars 
that talk about specifically uh, who, who talk about Hebrew we don't have time to go through it all to explain but first understand what the Bible is trying to say in Genesis in 224 we need to understand we have to go into the first chapter to, to be able to define this where it's written pay attention to the text in front of you it says so God Elohim created man Adam Adam means man a human being God created him in his own image okay but he said he said he created him in the in in the image of Elohim a plurality he says he created him individually a man and woman he created them he blessed them and and God said and now you see that them were multiplying how much did God how many people did God create one God created Adam who is that Adam that God created man and woman he created for us to see he uh, he repeats this in chapter 5 of Genesis the day that God Elohim um, when God created man he created him in his likeness so when Elohim created man he made him in his likeness man male and female he created them so from a uh, singular he moves to plural he male and female he created them and he blessed them and named them man or a people what did he call did he call him people no who is a who is a man in in um, the in the Bible when God says he made man in his image what does that mean man male and female they aren't people they are one man and male and female created in God's likeness that person that man who's in God's image God who is a, a singularity but a singularity that is um, a plurality plural Godhead so f Genesis 1 26 and 27 and f Genesis 5 1 shows us that um, man a singularity as male and female were carrying uh, were taking care of the were in the image of God Elohim so at the word Adam Adam means a human being male and female are named man when they were created because man Adam now I just wanted to finish the show we've proven everything we can, we can, I'm just trying to bring us to one understanding why in the Hebrew language the word for God is in plurality why in the Bible when we're reading that God is one the, u the word is used ehad not yahid to ex not why the same word that they had in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 were used for human beings that were created and the fifth chapter he says he says when God created man male and female he created them they were created in God's image and his likeness and they use the word ehad is that is that there's a lot of other things that we can talk about and that's how we saw when God was creating man there's a lot of um, different points I can show you here but I'd like to skip this over you'll see here Noam Sarna um, he's a Hebrew and he speaks Hebrew he speaks Hebrew fluently he is one of the best commenter commentators in the world about the book of Genesis and he says He's a very respectable figure. This is very. It's a. It's a very. 
unusual example that the first man is in plurality because the Israelite version of political groups was trans was changed into monotheism and paganism. Just notice a few more things. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, we have, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. People uh, interpret this as if he was reading to, um, he was telling to the angels, they've become now one of us. Is he talking to the angels? It says, one of us, God and angels. But if you look a little bit earlier in this chapter, chapter 3, verse 5, we see, who is this plurality, us? When the snake is talking to Eve and says, God knows that that... For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like Elohim, knowing good and evil. If you're eating from this tree, you'll become Elohim. And now in, in 3.22, God says, Behold, the man has become like one of Elohim, or one of us, knowing what is good and evil. You, when you see these two texts and you compare them, you see that this, this word isn't about angels here. God is talking about himself. Two or three, part of the... the Godhead that's not important. What's important is here we see this plurality of um, the Godhead. In Genesis 11, 7, he says, Come, let us go down and there and confuse their language. Who is God talking to here? Let us go down. If you go in the ninth verse, the Lord confused the language. Who is that us? This plurality is clearly um, connected to God, the God of the Old Testament. In Isaiah 6, 8, who am I going to send? It's a singularity. It says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? So, who will I send? Singularity. And who will go for us? Is plurality. And here Isaiah says, Here I am. Singularity. Send me. You see this in the Old Testament? This, uh, when you're talking about God, there's always a singularity and plurality. Why, in the same chapter, 6-8, angels um, kneel before God and they say holy 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 you have this also in Revelation 4 8 very interesting each word holy 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 is talking about one person of the Godhead it's just a question it's no evidence you're gonna ask me many people who are against the bible don't they see this of course they see it but when a man is saying something on purpose that you don't want to understand you start to speculate and you start to find many different um understandings of why the bible teaches it this way here what we have to um I was trying hard to to translate from the word from English plurality, the plurality of um, well then you're a very good person, why? If you want to show your respect to them, what you do, you say you are a very good person. 
uh, it's like the formal way of saying it. We don't really have it in English, but it's this um, plurality of majesty. Maybe in the old times, when someone wants to reject something from the Bible, then maybe becomes truth. Maybe in the old times when the Bible was written, people used this uh, plurality of of uh, of God to be explained. That's why God is always shown a plurality in the Bible. I can tell you that today there's so many biblical scholars that was researching this. Every person that's when people see this um, plurality of majesty in the Bible, they look at it and laugh because this plurality of majesty, which is actually from the German language that it came from, that never existed in the time of the Bible, not just in Israel, but never in this um, nation of Israel, this plurality of majesty never existed. God, when people came to appear before God and pray to God, they never they never talked to God in plurality, which you'll notice. Notice, pay attention now. We as we yesterday traveled from Canada and came here. Who am I talking about? We yesterday traveled from Canada and came here. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about a, I traveled to Canada yesterday. You can see that I'm talking about myself here and one person that was traveling with me. Oh. When we're talking individually about ourselves, we're talking about a plurality. But when you're talking on the other side, but never a person when you're talking about yourself is going to use plurality. In the Bible, you never have that people are are talking to God in plurality. It's always in singularity. But when God is speaking about himself, he's always using plurality. So you see, my brothers and sisters, if we, we need to be careful when we're trying to um, uh, push some ideas that people come up with. I can just show you here. You can have so many studies, you can find so many studies, but a lot of these ideas, this plurality, this uh, this plurality of majesty that was only in the um, only in the 19th and 20th century. No one from the Christians or the Hebrews would talk about this. You would see so many people today um, reject this idea. Just um, shortly, I want to explain that this, the the Israelites, when they were when they were talking about and reading about God and God as singularity or plurality, this had a big meaning to them. When we read the old uh, writings and the old scriptures, all people from the pagan nature and uh, nations, when we read about the Greek gods, who were always in plurality. We see that these pagan gods were always participating in some sort of debate and competition with one each one other, with each other. They were always making these games: who was going to be bigger, who was going to be greater than the other. But if we have God, uh, and who's in plurality, what is the key word that comes with this? And that is, God is love. When you see this biblical concept of God, it's not a pagan concept of God. It's simply uh, he prayed to the, when Christ prayed to the Father uh, to God. He said, "Father, I want them to be a had one, just like we are. You and I are one." God, God, Christ calls us that these three beings of the of the Godhead as an example of a way of how we as his followers his church that are built on this on this word need to be relate to each other i only have 10 minutes left i said we we didn't even go through 30 slides yet but i wanted to show you quickly through what i have here which 
you'll have this on your website. You can use this. Each each text you can look at afterwards, and I'll give you some more slides that other biblical scholars say about this, just for us to show you quickly that we have it in the New Testament as well. The most uh, famous verse in the Bible about the biblical uh, studies of the plurality of the Godhead is found in Matthew 28 to 19. You know this uh, clearly. Where it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you notice how people who are baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit? Is that what Jesus said? How many names are evident here? And how many names does God give the direction? And how many names? In one name. It's only in one name, and this name it comes up with how many parts of the God, uh, how many three, how many beings, three beings, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one name. There doesn't exist three. Three gods don't exist. Okay, there's three uh, div divine beings, but they have this. Uh, they have the same name. This is what we noticed here. I have to hear mention as well. Some questions that people might ask for more explanation here. Unfortunately, I have to mention that there are Adventists that one one text of the Bible bothers them. They prove that this verse was never actually even said by Jesus. And the people of the text that bother us, and we just kind of take them out because because. That doesn't work for my doctrine. Is that the way to do, to study the Bible? Well, really, I can show. That's my specialty. If you go to the New Testament department where I'm um, teaching a professor, maybe it's not it's not known to you, but we have films, almost all the earliest writings from the oldest um, writings of the Matthew Gospel. There's not even one. A manuscript that exists that in Matthew where that does, this doesn't appear. Even the earliest has this. Many people have a problem. Then, how do we in Acts read that the early Christians were baptizing just in the name of Christ? Here, I mentioned this a phrase that many people use this later when they are asking their questions. But we have to know that the Acts nowhere explains how baptism happens, how it was um, done. They don't t there's no formula written there how it's uh, baptized, how people get baptized. People were getting baptized in Jesus' time. But what does that mean? The apostles in the times of the Acts of the Apostles weren't we have to go in the Bible to really understand what it means doing something in his in their name. If you go to Acts chapter 2, 38 to 39, you'll see that the first baptism that's mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles after Peter's sermon was actually the baptism and three divine beings. So then what does it mean in baptizing in Christ's name? It means two things. It means doing something in somebody's name, doing the work of in the authority of a certain person. People, uh, Jesus says, many will tell me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we work in your name? Didn't we do persecute in your name? We did this in his name. In Luke, uh, sorry, in Acts 4 7, it talks about where the Hebrew elders, the Jewish elders, would say this. They asked them, In whose name are you doing this? So, what does this mean that the apostles were baptizing in Christ's name? It means that they were listening to his teachings. Jesus told them to baptize people in in the name of three divine beings. And we see in the Acts of the Apostles, the Apostles were baptizing in Christ's name, 
That means that they were respecting his direction and his way, and that they were they were baptizing him, baptizing people in the way that Christ told them to baptize. I can show you from the 80s to the 70s, uh, from the time 70 to 100 AD, and you can go to the first century, and you can see that the baptism of the uh, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit didn't come from this impersonal God. All the announcements of the church, you can see all these different um, articles that were about this. And the way that Christ specified to his disciples in Matthew, uh, the 19th and 20th verse in chapter 28 of Matthew. I can just keep showing you more and more how m many um, biblical scholars who shows that God is three divine beings. I can show you, I have one thing this afternoon that I'm going to explain how many announcements or how many um, quotes and passages from Ellen White you can find where she talks about that there are three divine beings when people are baptized. It's baptized in three heavenly divine beings. Here you can see how many um, citations from Sister White. It's not just one citation of Sister White. I need to finish. I knew I wouldn't be able to show all of this that I wanted to present, but I believe that uh, this afternoon we'll be able to ask questions. And some things that I sh was that I wasn't able to show, we'll have um, time this afternoon to talk more about this and explain what we had here. Um, I just want to ask one question: Does God, the Godhead, who's made up of three divine beings, I'd like to call you to to make the decision for yourself: Is this is there a problematic text in the Bible? Of course. But let's try to understand and under, and and notice these problematic texts in parallel with the clear verses that were given. Brothers and sisters, we need to study our Bibles. I can tell you, as I've, I'll mention later, understanding who God is and what kind of unity uh, it exists with three divine beings is what God left his nations, how we should live and how we should be with each other and with our relationships and, and he left with them to believe in one God.